51. Hey there, friends on YouTube and everywhere else. Back again for another episode of the Painfully Honest Tech Podcast. Here we are. It is Sunday, 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 Sunday. Sunday. It, it is the, what, 14th of January. Adam and I just got back from CES. For those of you who don't know, that's the Consumer Electronics Show. It's 100th Bam. anniversary. What consumer really? elect? Yeah, that's what. Uh, what consumer electronics were they showcasing? Uh, in- they did a really poor job of telling people it was the hundredth anniversary because I didn't the, see anything that said that. The only way that I knew was that at the very beginning, our, our friends Brian Tong and I Justine were the hosts, and they like walked through these like lit up zeros and said something about it being the hundredth anniversary. And if you went out into the into like the main sort of entry area, they had they had a hundred set up, but it was big enough that you could like not notice what it was if you didn't know to look. But anyway, the hundredth anniversary, yeah. I I mean, so nineteen twenty four. I, mean, <laughs> I was like three know. years before you were born, so you don't know either. Yeah, I mean, what like what what, what electronics were they showcasing in nineteen twenty four? I have no I'm idea. I'm sure it's just. Probably what it is is that CES in spirit has been around 100 years. Like 100 years ago, it was probably called something else or yeah, had some other focus. Yeah, because I don't think there was a lot of electronics back then. No. Uh, Maybe it was like, like the Conglomerated General Store Conference or something. <laughs> I, I don't know. But, you know, sometimes things will change over time, but it's still basically the same entity. It right. probably has something to do with that. Yeah, so so we just got back from that, and as always, it is a completely exhausting experience. Uh, yes. But we thought we'd we'd take some time to recap that, and then hit a couple of newsworthy things that are coming up in this in this uh, in this week that is approaching. Or, well, I guess it's Sunday. Officially, it is this week. Yes. But tomorrow's MLK Day, and it's a holiday for some people, and for some people, it's not. So. <laughs> I don't know. I'll be at um, home. But yeah, I'll, I'll, actually, be, I'll be here. I think the great blizzard of 2024 is already about to happen here. Let me see. Oof. So it's my kids are off tomorrow. Here. My kids are off tomorrow, but then they're off Tuesday because it's supposed to be in the lower 20s here in Houston, um, which is like chaos and pandemonium worthy. So... Whenever it gets into those hard freezing temperatures, typically around here, they're like, kids don't have to wait outside and freeze to death. Y'all can have the day off. Yeah. Oh, I know. Right now in Cedar Rapids, it is negative 10. <laughs> with That's a cold. High, with a high of negative six. <laughs> so. I have not experienced those temperatures in 13 years, and I don't miss them. Yeah, it says it says it feels like negative thirty two. Because that's the, painful. The, I I have been in yeah. negative 30, 35 wind temperatures before, and if it yeah. doesn't make you hate life, then you're not human. Yeah, it wasn't nearly this cold when I left. It was like in the forties when I when I left, and I didn't take a coat with me because we were going to Las Vegas. It was quite it was chilly in Las Vegas as well, but uh, but not like I had to wear a winter coat, chilly. So when I had to get on the airplane yesterday in Denver, and it was negative ten in Denver, that was uh, that was a little chilly. And then I, man, I don't know. It's I know everybody's always like, well, what about global warming? And I, well, I can't tell, sometimes I can't tell global you cooling time. gets you whenever you don't <laughs> expect it. I can't tell you the last time that it got this cold here, but when it well, does, it's not it's not fun. In the same vein as things, all things chilly, we saw a lot of cool things we at did. CES. Oh, nice, nice segue. Nice segue. What was your favorite? What was your favorite? Like two or three things that you saw at the CES. So there were a couple of G Wiz things that mm-hmm. I, I got to say the the biggest thing I think that got me kid in candy store excited, and maybe it's because I'm forty. Well, I'm sorry, I'll be forty in five days. Maybe it's because I'm thirty nine. And 98.99%. Uh, maybe it's because I really enjoyed the movie Honey, I Shrunk the Kids when I grew up. Grew up. But there were quite a few robot lawnmowers. And I'm like, I want one of these. 
I, I still I, remember when I was a kid, and you know, I was a kid back then. And I had to physically mow the yard, which I'm still doing. Uh, but the, they had the remote control lawnmower. I was like, man, this is the coolest thing ever. One day, this will be a reality. And finally, in life, I mean, I know they had them a year or two, but they're like really making a push with them now. So yeah, 2024. Finally, maybe I'll get my robot lawnmower. Yeah, I saw I saw the robot lawnmowers, um, and there were all, they also had robot pool, pool cleaners. cleaners. Yeah, those are they, cool too. Which I need for my pool. Yeah, you know, my friend Mark Ellis was did a sponsorship with a pool cleaner, and the, hyper a i p e r. It, that might have been it. I saw another one at the Venetian in their their expo room where it was a different brand, but. It was like climbing the walls of the little aquarium that they had put together. I was, I was, uh, I was duly impressed, but I, I don't have a pool. <laughs> well, I mean, I said to clean my pool with. I mean, I'm like trailer trash rich. I mean, I, I have one I put together in my backyard, but it's one of mm. the vinyl ones that's meant yep. to last for 30 years. It's 13 by 21, and it's right. four feet deep, so it's really big. Um, and my kids never use it. I'm just perpetually cleaning it. So having a <laughs> companion robot cleaner friend uh, would would be great. Yeah, but could it climb the walls of the of the plastic pool? Yeah, vinyl. Okay. It's not plastic. I'm... Don't try and put me in a corner. <laughs> <laughs> don't don't try and under describe your your trailer your trailer pool. <laughs> yes, no, don't you do it, Ricky Bobby. <laughs> oh, but there man. were some cool things. Uh, one, this is completely. Out of like, I would never be able to use this one because I'm fat and I would sink in the snow. But we don't really get snow down here in Houston, so you know how we have the e-scooters and the like mass proliferation oh, all yeah, over the place yeah. now. Did you see the e-snowmobile scooter? I didn't see it. I mean, I, I I saw someone else covering it, but I didn't see it myself. You probably saw the, my on picture on on the Twitter or whatever you want to call it. So yeah. it is a, it's an e-scooter type body, but it has the sled thing in the front, like the ski the snowmobile sled in the front. And it has the, like the track in the back. Right, so right. you can use this. I'm like, okay. But I, I mean, I would love to try it. I probably would kill myself, but I would love yeah. to try it. Yeah. I, I could see either one of us ending up on fail army with something like that. <laughs> Um, <laughs> which, maybe the maybe the viewers would like that. I don't know. I mean, Fail Army is one of my favorite YouTube channels. I think I That's watch everything got me, they put out. <laughs> two things got me watching YouTube many, many, many years ago. And maybe it was the first iteration of Fail Army. I'm pretty sure Fail Army existed then. But it was Fail Army and, like, music videos so I could listen to music at work. Right. And that was how I started watching YouTube. And then I would come home and be like, honey, watch this video. Watch this video. And she's like, you're stupid. <laughs> I don't know why Fail Army videos are like laugh out loud funny to me, because not much in my life is laugh out loud funny, but I laugh my, my rear end off at Fail Army videos all the time. Except um, for the only ones I hate watching the skateboard ones, because oh. I just know that a bone got broken and it just, yeah. my my heart cringes. I have to look away. I, I It's funny, I, I was an EMT for many years. But I don't like broken bones. Like I just, I really don't like dealing with that uh, or seeing that because there's just nothing you can do. They're just sitting yeah. there like, uh, you know, well, we can splint that in its current broken position and transport you to the hospital. Yeah, I the skateboard ones are hard too because they they usually involve like some kind of stair rail and and like a, a male skateboarder landing on his crotch. It's, yeah, that it, that or. Flying off the side of something and landing on concrete, which is never good for your body. I, I have to admit, I, I do like seeing the drunk people who injure themselves. <laughs> it's just, you know, it's like, I don't know why. Maybe maybe it's because, like, I used to be that stupid. Oh, no. the other ones are, the other ones that are very cringe for me are the parkour ones. Like, mm. you see some guy, like, jump over the side of this wall and you just know he's not going to make it. Yeah. And that, that sound whenever they smack on the concrete, like 12 feet below, like, why yeah. would you do that? Like, why would you do this to your perfectly good body? Yeah, sometimes you can hear the person's head crack onto the surface of whatever, whatever they fell on. And it's like, wow, that's 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 a concussion. 
Yeah. <laughs> so, but you know, I so for me, let me see. CES, what did I what did I like the most? Um I think for me, it was more like a I kind of walked around and just looked generally at stuff and kind of tried to see what what bigger overarching themes were were kind of presenting themselves at the show and the one thing that I noticed was a lot of companies like Sony and TCL and uh, I think a couple of others were doing a lot of like automobile tech so like there's interior. a lot of automobile integration from a lot of the big companies and yeah. whether that's through partnerships whether that's through their own connected stuff but yeah uh, Sony they had a they had a demo um, and I feel bad because Qualcomm had set me up to go see that uh, BMW like Qualcomm connected car right but I got the, I got the time wrong because <laughs> of mm. the, some of my meetings ended up in the wrong time because I set them in my calendar while I was here in Houston and then when I traveled to uh, right. Las Vegas which is two hours behind then they would not be correct so yeah. and not not all of them did I catch so uh, they invited me. I felt bad, but I wanted to see that connected BMW car experience. I think that would have been cool. There was also the G wagon that uh, Mercedes has yep. that has the wheels that like all the wheels pivot now. So yeah. I just saw him just sitting there doing donuts, like spinning around in circles with the car moving nowhere. I'm like, I mean, that's what I've always wanted to do with a hundred eighty thousand dollar car. But yeah, I mean, they, yeah. yeah, cool. <laughs> well, you know, the funny thing is, the, the last time that I went to CES, you know, there's there's the sort of big consumer tech companies lg samsung sony like all those they're they're on like the main floor in the las vegas convention center but there's also another place where automobile manufacturers have their own sort of setup west and, hall yeah because this is the, but this is the first year that i saw like a lot more automobile stuff in the main hall and yep. most of that was was the I think TCL had like a, a a dummy car that was showing like different a different dashboard configuration that kind of ran across the entire top of the yep. of the dashboard. But they also had a heads up dashboard display where like color screens were doing heads up display right onto a a mock windshield that was pretty cool. Um, Sony had their their concept car that they're doing with Honda there. Yep. And that was pretty cool. Um, and again, the, th the thing about CES is maybe like 80 or 90% of the stuff is, uh, well, it's definitely not going to be on the market this year kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, some, for sure. Some of it is showcases. Aspirational. Stuff yeah. Some of it, like the TVs and things like that, you know, the more, the more like straight to consumer stuff. Definitely, that you're seeing the new model for next year, but some of the more out there things are are, are aspirational <laughs> at best. Aspirational, yeah. Um, there, there's some cool stuff. But last year was the the first year that they really had a bunch of EV stuff, and they built and completed like I think the West Hall last year was their first time with it. Maybe it was two years ago. I think it might have been last year, and they had all the. EV stuff over there with all these different companies you've never even heard of and some of the accessories for them. And I barely made it over there this, this year because I just had so many stinking appointments. Right. <laughs> Normally I don't have appointments. So the first two or three years I've gone to CES, I just kind of walk around and spend my time how I want and look at what I want. And this year it was like three or four meetings with companies like every single day. So it was like, all right, let me go to the show floor for an hour. Let me go to a meeting. Let me go to the show floor for an hour or two. Let me go to another meeting. So I didn't get to see as much as I wanted to, but one thing uh, that I'm always continually excited about is we have more of the XR glasses. So I, I got a chance to stop by uh, and look at X Reels exhibit yeah. that they had there. So yeah. X Reels new glasses that are coming out; those are pretty sweet. And then TCL's new like Raycon Neo Two lights or something. There's a yeah. few different brands that I mean these things are just getting so good, <laughs> and yeah. I'm I'm really excited about that. So. I'm curious to see where it goes because yeah. it started off with just, okay, we have these glasses you can watch video on. And then some of them have added like AR XR elements to them. And some of them are getting better with the software. So it, it'll be cool to see where they are in like four or five years, but I think they're very, at this point, quite practical. 
Yeah, and you know, the one thing that surprised me was like not so I've done videos on X Real. I think I did two X Real videos in 2023 and I did a TCL video and I did a Rokid video. I didn't see if Rokid was there. I didn't see their their I didn't see Rokid. So yeah. maybe maybe they're having issues cuz uh I did see X Real, I did see TCL and Rokid. Those are like the three big ones. Yeah, and what they had out last year was was generally pretty good, although like practicality wise, like there's still there was still a little ways to go. And what I saw from TCL and X Real was like, oh okay, you know, now not only do they have the glasses that kind of co- you know like cover and it's sort of XR but or AR, but it's you know you can see some or you can like cover it up and you can be totally immersed. But then they had some like clear lens glasses. Yeah, so the new, I think it's the new TCL ones have some clear lens elements to them yeah. uh, where it can project something onto, like, so you can wear them while you walk around and see, like, a notification or or right. some other things. I'm not exactly sure, so don't quote me to the extent on that, but I know that they're taking it up a notch. Yeah, yeah, and the funny thing to me about all of this, because there were a lot of in the gate when when I walked through the gaming section, there were a lot of VR style gaming peripherals and and different kind of physical experience enhancers. That sounds dirty, but that's not what I mean. Well, I mean there was one of those that was very disturbing to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean um, I know this is a, a fairly family friendly podcast ish thing yeah. but la- so many, last so year many kids are sitting around watching that listen watching the podcast with their parents yeah well i know one of them two of mine will so let me try and express this <laughs> in the best way possible so they had a i think like two years ago they allowed to them to start adding um physical pleasure devices uh into their into the the show and they had one that they were really really pushing for women last year and now this year they had one for men, and I'm like, uh, no, thank you. <laughs> I, yeah, they they I, wanted me to stop and look at it. I'm like, I'm not going to shoot a video on this. I, I'm just going to move along and pretend like I didn't see this. Yeah, I, I didn't I didn't catch that one. Um, I think it was called The Handy. Oh. I think that's what the name was. Yeah, they were very uh, <laughs> very clever with the name. <laughs> well. I think I think I can get an idea at this point of what it might be doing. Um, yeah, but yeah, it's, I did see there was a cockpit that you could sit on with VR glasses on, and then I think it had like hand controls. And all I, all it did, all I saw was this guy like sort of spinning in circles and then like kind of flipping over and over. And I, I was just like, that's really cool, but I don't I don't know. If I want nearly that um, that much immersion, <laughs> when can I play it with Mario Kart? That's what I want to know. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what he was playing because I just uh, I just was watching the th- the machine go in circles, but there was there was a lot of that. There was a lot of uh, there was a lot of like car based sort of stuff. It, it, there was a lot more AR slash VR stuff at. CES than I think I anticipated and it flies against the sort of narrative that we hear from the general the general conversation which is that like nobody cares about AR and VR it's already it's already kind of failed or whatever um you know when when people talk about the the Vision Pro they they bring that up as a you know we've had we've had VR for 40 years or whatever it is and it's oh. never I think there's a lot of speculation based off of past failed uh, attempts at these things that just yeah. embed themselves into people's minds. And then there's just a lack of understanding of what the new stuff is doing because like the new Apple vision pro is not an XR AR VR headset. <laughs> it is a spatial computer. Yeah. yeah. And I, I think a lot of people think a lot of the comments that I've gotten on the, uh, the vision pro stuff that I've made has has sort of equated it to VR more than AR. I don't. A lot of people still don't really make the distinction or understand the difference between VR and AR. But VR is virtual. Yeah, everybody thinks where you, everything is like sort. You're you're sort of immersed in the goggles themselves, and it creates an external like a 
a virtual experience. AR is augmented reality where you can kind of see the world around you with stuff added on. It's like and a virtual Vision Pro, overlay. Yeah, and Vision Pro is really from a little bit of both because you can black out the Vision Pro screen and watch a movie or something like that or or do other things, but then you can also just like see totally like all the way through, pass through with no problems whatsoever. I think we're going to find that Vision Pro is umpteen times more dialed in and 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 sort of ready for prime time than a lot of what's already on the market. But I think that, you know, that just that that just leads people in a new direction, you know? And it seems like and I can't I can't really ascribe causation to this, but it seems like okay, Apple announces Vision Pro and then suddenly I go to CES the next, you know, six months later and there are all these AR Vision AR apparatus things. Yeah, yeah. App so, apparati. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because there's also there's also no correlation between the complainers and the people who are actually going to buy this thing. So right. it's not designed for the people who are complaining about it being a VR headset, for one. Yep. But two, they're only making like fifty thousand of these things first run. So yep. they're they're gonna be gone. Like fifty thousand of an Apple product is unreal. Yes. I've yep. never heard of them ever making any sample size of product this small. So it's going to be hard for people who even really, 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 really want to get one to get one. And then on top of that, it's basically $4,000 if you factor in tax. So, yeah. And I think, well, we'll talk a little bit more about Vision Pro because the pre orders go up later on this week. But I want to. On my birthday. Yay. You going to get yourself one for your birthday? No. No. <laughs> uh -oh. But yeah, it's uh, CES is, you know, they got the big companies there. Some years there's more computer or like, you know, related stuff. I remember in past years, Razer has had always like a big, impressive setup. I walked through Razer's booth this year and it was uh, the more peripherals and, and sort of their gaming chairs. I guess they have a, like a haptic gaming chair now. And I think that they even have like custom sizing or something like that. I saw I just seen talking something about going and getting fitted by Razer for a chair. Yeah. Yeah. So I was like, that's kind of odd, but yeah, Razer's always there. And it's funny because I, I thought there was a lot less of some of those types of things, uh, like smaller, smaller yeah. companies and smaller, more unique items. They used to be in the South hall. So right. when we went four years ago, the South hall had five or six drone companies, you know, they had a bunch of computer companies. That's where they had all the, that's where they had all the massage chairs. That's where they right. had a lot of the smart home. And the South Hall has since been vacated. And all that stuff now is over at the Venetian. Right. So I didn't realize that the first day I was there and I walked around all the Central Hall. I tried to go to the South Hall. There was nothing there. I'm like, where's all this stuff? Like, we're missing a lot of things. Yeah. And then day before last, I went to the Venetian. And I'm like, ah, I have found it. So yeah. I, I was pleasantly surprised with some of the things that I saw over there. Yeah, I... I hadn't made it to the Venetian before, but I had to go over there for for a sponsored thing that I was doing. And there it was, they had a big setup going at the Venetian. There was a, it yeah, was a really big a, production. A lot of stuff. So Did you see the uh the drone soccer uh yes, thing? I did. It I, was did crazy. I didn't I didn't get to see much of a demo, but I did see like the big setup that they had. So people were flying them when I was there and I took my brother with me this time as my production assistant. He was helping me out with some things and they had like this internal field set up. It was probably right. like 25 feet high and it had these hanging rings and then they would use this drone that they were flying around and trying to fly through the, the ring or the hoop to score points. Right. It was really neat. They were really loud, but it was, it was a pretty cool thing. Yeah. Yeah. It did. It, it, it was, well, from what I've heard, I didn't go the past couple of years, and it didn't happen in 2021, right? Correct. Or it happened virtually or something like that. Uh, yeah, it, it happened virtually. There was nothing there. It was a complete yeah. waste of time. Yeah. So last time I went was 2020. Uh, in the past couple of years, I guess, from hearing from you and other people, it's just like kind of slowly gotten back to its close to its like previous size. 
but I think I enjoyed I enjoyed looking at the AR VR stuff. I enjoyed looking at um, all the all the automobile stuff. There were some. So CES has they claimed one hundred thirty five thousand participants. A hundred, which is a lot. So this it is. I still I think historically it's on the low side. Now it's more than there was last year. Mm -hmm. Last year was still pretty uninspiring. So this year. I think there was mostly just enough stuff there to make it worth it, quote unquote, uh, for me to go out there. So I'm hoping it'll be better again next year. Uh, when we went four years ago, it was amazing. Yeah. And I, I know part of it was my first time there and my whole life I wanted to go to CES. I, I was born and then my first words were CES, according to my parents. <laughs> but I always wanted to go. And so the first time I went, it was like a fantastic experience. And then the last two years was just really, really depressing. You know, yeah, it's like shopping at Walmart, but they're going out of business. So they just have a couple racks left that things haven't kind of pilfered through yet. And it's stuff yeah. that nobody wants. That was CES the last two years. <laughs> so this this time I was very, my, my heart was emboldened uh, yeah. and my spirit was refreshed with the, dec the decency of CES. Yeah, and... I really enjoyed some of the smaller stuff because they do have these major, these major companies, but then they have offsite stuff that is for smaller manufacturers or, or startups or things that are just coming out. And uh, one of those is a, a show that they, I guess it's an event that they do every year called Showstoppers, which is a lot of yeah. smaller, smaller tech companies that are kind of just getting off the ground and maybe they have like one product. And it was, it was kind of interesting because one of the things I like about, CES and other events like like that is that usually I, I usually get to see people who I know and have met or have never met in person but have like interacted with from the YouTube sphere. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that not the sphere I, at Las Vegas, the YouTube no. sphere. Yes. So <laughs> people that I people that I know one way or the other that I get to like hang out and talk with because the one thing about the YouTube job is you don't really have like coworkers to talk around a water cooler with. You know, so, so it was interesting to walk into showstoppers on, what was that? Tuesday, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, Wednesday night, Wednesday yeah. night. Yeah. And the first thing that I saw was uh, Michael Fisher, Mr. Mobile. Yep. And this year he was not a YouTuber. This year. Well, he still is. He, he didn't yeah. quit, but he was wearing a different hat. Yeah, this year he's he's gone into business with uh, some other folks, Crackberry Kevin, and and some other folks. They have and Michael did a video about this a week or two ago, mm. and I haven't had a, I haven't had a chance to watch it, so I felt bad. Shame, but, shame. <laughs> they've made a physical keyboard for the iPhone. The iPhone. Oh, it's called Clicks. Yes, and it the idea behind it is sort of like the BlackBerry keyboard. It's it does it it doesn't feel like the BlackBerry keyboard, but it has that no. same kind of that same kind of vibe, and so I, I I really enjoyed getting a demo of that because I feel like it's a lot more practical and a lot more useful and it and a lot more no matter what no matter how smart you know keyboards like the iPhone keyboard or Android Google keyboard or you know. No matter how smart they've gotten, there's still certain things that annoy me. And uh, well, the other thing for you and I and other people who use a lot of social media apps, especially if you try and post on Instagram, you try and post on TikTok, autocorrect doesn't work when you're trying to type hashtags and things like that. Right. So uh, it just throws it right out the window. <laughs> so sometimes it can be really annoying trying to retype and type and try and get these things to work properly when you're used to having autocorrect and then you don't have autocorrect yeah. so having a physical keyboard would be really nice for that well, and, and me and... sorry go ahead go ahead no no, no, no. Uh, let's say me being like one of the, one of the latest foremost authorities on on blackberry for years uh, i love physical keyboards and it's funny i've gotten a lot of mixed feedback because some people are like oh this is stupid nobody wants this we got rid of this years ago because nobody wanted it. The thing is, 
not a whole lot of people can just there's not i don't know there's enough people to necessarily justify somebody building a big elaborate expensive keyboard phone at this point in time but 139 dollars accessory for people like me who would love to have one is another story it's an accessory like you don't look at people who have an ipad pro and like oh no you you're a loser because you have a keyboard to type on your ipad like yeah. why it's it's an accessory just like headphones are an accessory just like a s pen or a stylus or an apple pencil is an accessory well i mean apple's magic keyboard which they make for their ipads is 300 and something 350 dollars for the 12.9 inch version yeah and well the value the value like the the budget friendly apple pencil is what like 99 dollars or 79 yeah. whatever it is i mean yeah. there's no real accessory you can get for an iphone or a mac product that is cheap <laughs> so it's just not no. a reality but the thing that i really appreciated because i talked to both michael and kevin uh about how they made this keyboard was i think you anybody can like contract with the chinese company get some get some some mock-ups made and put out an accessory right mm -hmm. but it might it might only have limited and maybe even frustrating aspects to it right but these guys i guess have been working on this keyboard for a long time and wanted to wanted it to be of the same quality of like an iphone experience they didn't want well, they've be... been working directly with Apple, like their software yeah. division, to try and make sure everything works properly with iPhone. And the nice thing is there are existing shortcuts within iOS that a lot of people don't realize you can use because you don't have the keyboard. Like Basically, they're the same ones that are in iPad OS, so right. where you can use the command button and do certain shortcuts that way. When you're using it and looking at a web page, if you hit the space bar, it scrolls yeah. down for you. So there's, the there's some cool things. Down. That's 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 the big one for me. Like being yeah, able to, instead nice. of having to like just keep doing this, like to be able to just tap 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 on the on the space bar to sort to sort of move through. When I saw the the hotkeys and different things that were there, a I realized, wow, we we don't have those on iOS, you know, as we use it now. Nope. And it gives you back the the entirety of your screen. Yeah, you know, while you're so, typing on it, you can have full access to your screen, which was one of the great benefits of having a BlackBerry because it didn't get in the way. When you right. type on an iPhone and your software keyboard comes up, you're missing this whole part of the screen. So you're having to like scroll so you can see some of the things while you're trying to type. Yeah. Whereas with the clicks keyboard that you can attach onto your phone, you don't have that problem. And I think, you know, probably a lot of the folks, a lot of the Android folks who listen to the podcast or watch the podcast are sitting there thinking like, well, where's the Android version? And I can understand that. Uh, Android is, you know, Google keyboard is a, is open source and on everybody's, everybody's keyboard. But because this keyboard is, it, it attaches as though it were a case. Mm. And it's, it's just at this point, maybe in their, in their, at this point in their journey with this, iPhones are, you know, there aren't as many different versions. There aren't as many different models. You know, you can kind of. Oh yeah, if you were to try, be... you have to make sure it fits every phone. Like individually, it has to be the same. It has to be the right size. It has to have the right connections. It has to have the right dimensions. Like, there's so many things. If you're like, let's make this for Android, you're like, so which one? <laughs> yeah. Uh, with the iPhone, you're like, okay, let me cover the 14 Pro, which the first one is available on is the 14 Pro, then the 15 Pro, and then the 15 Pro Max. So I'm sure if it's successful, it'll probably bleed over into some of the popular phones on Android. But let's see if it's successful first. And you know, I have a lot of, of mixed comments. A lot of people in my video, because I made a video about it, are like, right. oh my gosh, it's amazing. I'm going to go buy one. And then you have the people who are like, this is stupid. Who wants a keyboard? And then there's people who are like, well, I'm kind of interested, but $139 is too expensive. So and, well, let's see how many people actually buy it. And the one thing I would say, again, for for people who are, who are thinking like, oh, well, that's that's too expensive for a keyboard, is that their philosophy behind this was we don't want to just like make a make a keyboard that can hook up via Bluetooth to your iPhone or hook up via the USB-C or the lightning connector 
and be a keyboard but not be fully integrated into your iOS experience. So they, they've been working and working and working to make this thing like as though it were an Apple peripheral. And Yeah, and the other I, nice thing is if you want one, buy it. If you don't, you don't have to. As, like, a lot of people, that's, that's one thing that I don't like. There are people in this world who like to complain about something existing just because they don't want it. Yeah. And I, I had this conversation with somebody the other day. I'm like, so they're like, nobody, I can't see why this is appealing to anybody. Nobody, you sh nobody would want to buy this. This is stupid. I'm like, so do every time you go to the restaurant, you tell the wait staff that at, when you order your food, why do you make any other food? This is so stupid. Nobody else wants to buy that. Right. Like just because it's not something that you want doesn't mean other people aren't happy about it. Yeah. And I know a lot of people who are very happy about it. So I, I think it, I think it will be successful enough. And I think once people who might be on the fence about something like that become more familiar with what it is and what it can do, I think much like myself, you know, and not really knowing a ton about it before I went to the to the show and saw the physical demonstration, I was just kind of like, well, that's, that's cool, you know? It, it, but then when I saw the physical demonstration, I could see like a lot of things that make it attractive that I hadn't considered beforehand. And so I think a lot of people will see that as well. Um, and they won, they, you know, they, they give out like 9 billion awards. <laughs> yeah, but they did receive an award. <laughs> they but received they did, awards. But they did get an award <laughs> for this, which I think was well-deserved because you could tell how much thought had gone into building this thing. And again, like smartphone peripherals are a dime a dozen. And... I don't think a lot of times people make a lot of a lot of an as much of an effort to make it as good as it can be. And these guys, but they brought in actual talent from BlackBerry. They they brought in yeah. guys that used to work for BlackBerry to yeah. help with the making of this keyboard. So like they 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 went the extra mile. If you pick this up and you typed on it, it would. I mean, I don't want to say it's the BlackBerry experience because it's not. I mean, it's yeah. the the number rows on the top, it very much emulates the iOS keyboard. This is very much an iPhone keyboard. This is not a BlackBerry yeah. keyboard, but the quality, the quality, the typing experience and what you get out of it, it does it does bring back some of those memories. And even though I, I've never typed on this keyboard before with this layout, because of the physical muscle memory that I have previously, and then I use the iOS keyboard on my phone, it didn't take that long for me to actually start typing on it with some level of proficiency. Yeah, no, I, I, that's one thing that I actually said to them as I sort of played around with it was a lot of times you get a peripheral keyboard or, or something like that. And they'll, for, for space reasons or whatever, they'll have moved keys from where they normally would be to someplace else or underneath a hot key combination or something like that. But this was pretty much like exactly as you, your your sense memory of typing on the iPhone keyboard is is pretty much like mimicked entirely on this keyboard. So they they did a good job, and I do want to say one thing though. Like it's not all sunshine and rainbows because right. this is the 15 Pro Max, yeah. And imagining this much extra space because it's about two and a half inches, yeah, added onto the bottom of the phone. It's much more manageable, I think, with the 14 Pro and the 15 Pro. Yeah. But imagining having that extra space on the bottom of my 15 Pro Max, I will get one <laughs> so I can type on it. But it does make the phone a couple inches larger. So might stick out of your pocket, might feel like it's kind of large. Cause, I mean, it is. So there is that. But honestly, after typing on it for like 10, 15 minutes, I, I didn't really I didn't really pay too much attention to that. I think that, you know, if if this comes out and and becomes like an accessory that you can sort of count on as being available when you purchase a new phone, I could see myself choosing the smaller version of the Pro phone because I know having that keyboard addition would make it bigger and make the experience more Pro Max like even though, you know, it's still the pro phone. Well, it's nice because the case, it has a little leather pad on the back 
on like the bottom section of the phone to make it more comfortable and premium yeah. while you're holding it. And since it plugs directly into the phone, there's no lag. It's not yeah. like when you use a Bluetooth keyboard for anything you type and you're always trailing behind what you're actually typing. Right. It's instantaneous yeah. as if you were to type it on the screen. So there's a lot of good things. And this is not an advertisement for them. I mean, maybe they'd like to sponsor a future podcast, but this that, is... And uh, we'd be certainly willing to have that discussion, but... I'll send I'll send this video to Kevin afterward. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the thing is, like, you know, Michael's been on the podcast. He's a, he's a friend of the show. And he's he's been, you know, a YouTuber that I, I've watched forever. I know you've watched forever. I'm sure most people who have uh, her watching or listening to this have familiarity with Mr. Mobile. And it was just, it was really cool to me to see him sort of take the step over to to the product side. Because, you know, so, yeah, this is something that we've we talked about a little bit. You know, there seems to be this huge proliferation, or more so this year than in previous years, of... YouTubers who've been doing it for a long time, kind of stepping away or altering their relationship with their channels. And so to see Michael make this step over to the product side with a product that he's really excited about was mm -hmm. was cool. And I mean, in terms of like interest and practicality, I kind of feel like that key that keyboard addition for the iPhone was one of the things that I could see myself like one well I wanted to walk out of the show with one you know I wanted, I wanted to have one to take with me and a lot of times you see you'll see stuff at CES and you'll be like oh that's pretty cool but I'll, it'll never make it to the market and I never would want it if I if it did you know cuz it's just too much this that or the other thing so I from a practicality standpoint and from a usability standpoint that was that was something that really did stand out to me uh, amongst all the other stuff that I saw so. Well, I have one concern, though, because I change phones like I change clothes, except, well, less frequently. I change clothes more often than I buy new phones. However, when it comes to the iPhone in this case, I get the new iPhone every year, and yep. they're one size. They're not one size fits all. So that means if I get attached to this attachment, then uh, every year I'll be having to spend like $150 to buy a new one just to keep using it with my phone. Yeah, yeah, that's that's true, but I think but I that, think that's our, not a real world problem for most people. Yeah, our our experience with phones is is not typical of of most people's uh, in the in the in the marketplace. Let's say, but the one thing I can say about iPhones is that, and, and you know, this is either a negative or a positive, depending on how much you want to look at it. They, I think that the to, the from the twelve to the fourteen. There were certain cases of certain models that would still fit. I know the twelve, like the camera bump on the twelve, was smaller than the thirteen and fourteen, but you could still well, use, you could still use the case of the thirteen and fourteen on the twelve. I think yeah, I think the twelve and thirteen, but I think they learned the error of their ways and found another way to screw us out of buying more cases when they went yeah. to the fourteen, and then definitely the fifteen uh, does doesn't work. Yeah, yeah. So I mean. There might be a, there might be the odd year where you could get away with you know having the same case twice, twice in one year, but who knows? Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I just CES was exhausting. It was like sensory overload as it is every year, and I don't think it, it's it's really hard. If I tried to describe like how you feel after you've been at CES for like three or four days, it's really it's really hard. It's very it's fatiguing. It's and you don't realize it. Demanding, yeah. It's physically demanding because Las Vegas, just this the the area of Las Vegas that has the convention center and the hotels and casinos, like, is much larger than you think it is. <laughs> you know, because those those casinos are the size of like small planets. That's no yeah. moon. <laughs> Most of the casinos, and hotels have their own convention space yeah. that in itself is the size of most good sized cities convention centers. Yeah. So the actual Las Vegas convention center itself is probably 10, five times the size of a Walmart. At least. Yeah. If, 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 if not, maybe super seven or eight Walmart. times the size. Yeah. Of, yeah it's it, yeah, super Walmart. You remember they started calling those super uh, yeah. whatever I was well I was a teenager so 
uh, they were, it was cool because like Super Walmart, we have a grocery store and a store. I know. And then and now, now Super Target Walmart. was like, Target's yeah. like, I can't be out done. Super Target. And then the only one that actually put it on the outside sign, though, was Super Kmart. Yeah. There was never anything super about Kmart, though. Except, except, except. Little Caesars was inside. <laughs> <laughs> and we would always go, we would go to Super Kmart. <laughs> We would get done shopping and we would grab a Bigfoot pizza and like two things of crazy bread and some Pepsi and we would go home and eat. Yeah. Yeah. Little Caesars, like in its early pizza, days, pizza. was really good. I, I, I feel like Little Caesars of, of the more modern vintage wasn't, I mean, it, did, it wasn't two pizzas anymore. Right? So if you go to Little Caesars nowadays in the year 2024, you can get some good pizza. The regular pizza, not so good, never buy the hot and ready because it's only hot and ready. It's not hot, fresh and ready or hot, good and ready. Yeah. But if you call there. ahead, if you call ahead and you have them actually make the pizza and get like an extra most bestest pepperoni and then you get some crazy bread and you ask them to put the extra butter and Parmesan on it, mm. that is a delicious experience, at least in the first 20 minutes. <laughs> and, then, and then you have to go to the bathroom. <laughs> But but no, uh, it, maybe, yeah. Uh, but yeah, yes. I I mean, so traveling it can be exhausting, and then just by itself, like you could be going on vacation. You have to go to the airport and fly in an airplane, and then you get off, and then you might lay on the beach for a whole week. But something about that, like getting Act on and traveling. off the airplane. <laughs> Is is exhausting in its own right, and then CES like, I was I was both mortified at how many steps I take on a given day on average, and then also mortified by how many steps I took on any given day at CES. It was like, on average, I take twenty nine hundred steps, which is bad. Well, I saw but... one. I was looking at it, and it's like the exercise ring. And I was joking with my brother because we were looking at the the metrics on our Apple watches and. It was like, you exercised 66 minutes today. I'm like, I feel like I did more than that. And then you look at the histological data, and it's like the mo the Saturday before I left, it said I exercised one minute. So I'm like, well, I guess going from one minute <laughs> was, to 66 minutes. That was minutes, when you like ran up the stairs to get to dinner. <laughs> well, I, the amount of steps I was taking, and I guess normally I'm probably a three or 4,000 step kind of guy yeah. a day. I, I don't know, maybe. But while I was there, I was just looking at it in miles. And I'm like, normally I just walk out to my office 10 times a day and maybe right. go to Taco Bell. But yeah, I was doing about eight to 10 miles a day uh, on, on top of all the like talking. And yeah. Normally talking is not a, a very draining thing. But when you talk to people all day long, it gets very fatiguing, especially after days of doing it. Yeah. And you move from from one place to another and one person to another. And, and it's just like... I think that the first sounds like my twenties we again. Yeah, the first <laughs> full day that we were there, I took something like sixteen thousand steps, and it turned out it was it was like close to seven miles or something like that. I, I mean, which the last time I remember taking that many steps was don't say high school. No, the last time I went to New <laughs> the last time I went to New York City, and not only was I going to like. So it was a Samsung Note 10 launch event. This was 2018. But then I was also visiting friends who I have for, who still live in New York that I haven't seen since I lived in New York. And I walked something like almost 19,000 steps in one day around New York City. <laughs> and, and I've uh, done that. that was, yeah, that was, that was kind of like, oh, wow. I mean, obviously, when I lived in New York, I walked a lot. But I didn't have, you know, an Apple Watch or anything else, else like that, so I didn't really have a a sense of how much I was walking. But yeah, and I tell you what, just for the for the folks who who are at home and want to know like how exhausting it can be, coming back from CES, I had to get up at four forty five so I could get an Uber at five, so I could get to the airport. And get my my flight out that was left at like six thirty. Well, that was uh, what was that Friday? And I hear a plot was coming. Yeah, I ended up getting home yesterday at like two p.m. 
<laughs> so, yeah, not, it's it, not that long of a flight. No, no, my first flight went off without it without any real problems. But there was obviously, a, I mean, there's a lot of weather going on across the country right now, and we live in Iowa, and Iowa gets gets weather sometimes. And so my wife is looking like we got twelve inches one night and then like five or six inches the other night and then it was a blizzard condition thing going on friday so i got on my second plane and I, and we are in the air halfway to cedar rapids which is where it's like then i'll be home and this was like 1 p.m on friday so i was going to be home and it, would, it was going to be great and the captain comes on and says well they can't they can't keep the snow off the runways in Cedar Rapids. So we're gonna have to turn around and go back to Denver. Oh. It's just like no, let's let's not do that. I and, saw your uh, tweet and I was like, oh my gosh, that sucks so bad. <laughs> so then I had to stand they said, okay, this flight's officially canceled. So go to our customer service place at gate 39 and get rebooked onto another flight. Well, I got to the customer service place, and the line was already like one football field long, and it just kept getting longer. And I stood in line for three hours. So you went on a three-hour tour. <laughs> I did. Like, I stood for so long that I, I feel like I have a bruise on the bottom of my right foot from, like, just standing and shifting. And uh, oh, that's, that's so hateful. So I, I don't, I don't envy you. Yeah, I ended up getting a flight out yesterday at seven a.m., which meant I had to make a quick hotel reservation in Denver, and uh, yeah, stayed at the American, American, like American or American, American. Are, are you an like American or an American? You remember that line from? Uh, What's it called? Uh, Once upon a time in Mexico. Oh yeah, Johnny yeah. Johnny Depp says, "Are you a, a Mexican or a Mexican? You an American? <laughs> are you an American or an American at the American Inn?" Man, I I tell you what, like just that on Friday night as I was just panicking that the weather would keep going south, and I would just not south the direction, but just bad. I couldn't sleep. And it it had like started snowing in Denver, and it was negative five degrees, and I was like, I'm never gonna, I'm never gonna get home. <laughs> yeah, we talked about this on Friday, Thursday night before you left that morning. Yeah, yeah, it was. So I mean, I CES is a great experience, but man, if anything, if anything goes wrong, like it's easy to just like topple over the edge into sheer exhaustion, <laughs> and. Yeah, uh, there are some good. Mode. There's some. I mean, I I enjoy CES, and I think one thing maybe we didn't touch on as much. It's always nice meeting new people yep. because in this space that we work in, like you said, it's nice seeing familiar faces, but it's also nice meeting a lot of new people. And every single time I go out there, I'm always meeting new people. So right. uh, I get to meet uh, Patrick Rambles. I get to meet a couple other people. I get to meet. Uh, Ian's tech, which I don't know if you know him or not. Little, he, he's been doing it for a little while. I got to oh meet John Prosser, which was interesting. Oh boy, yeah, because we're, like, we're... <laughs> I feel like meeting John Prosser was like the the highlight of my CES because he's like I've known John since like 2016, and we have been friends for that long, and I'd never met him in person, and he never goes anywhere. So no, he's a recluse. So, yeah, so. He like popped up at this this event that we were all at, and I was like, ah, oh, in Prosser. denim, no, yeah. no less in denim, of course, with the <laughs> with the faux sheepskin collar. Yes, and it was like nine hundred. <laughs> it was nine hundred degrees in that in that little space. Oh my gosh, yeah. And uh, well, I can kept, remember he kept you, the you, coat on for the whole time. So I was you, you impressed. went over, you went over to go say hi. You're like John. Anyway, I'm like John, and I have a tumultuous relationship, uh, yeah, right. meaning we have no relationship, but we've been at odds a few different times. Uh, not in, I think, a really bad way. Like, just we're both very strongly opinionated people with sometimes different opinions on the spectrum. So I was standing there where you and I had been talking. And I see this guy, who's not the tallest guy in the world, wearing denim, pointing in my direction. And normally when people are pointing in my direction, they don't want me. I'm a very un 
like come over here person, right? But standing there pointing at me. So I go like this. And then like he just keeps pointing at me, but I couldn't tell if he was nodding or not. So then I'm like, me? Yeah. <laughs> and we did that about three times. And he's like this. I'm like, all right, fine. I guess you're looking for me. So I go over there. He's like, hey, man, it's so great to meet you. And gives me a hug and stuff. I'm like, totally not how I ever thought this was going in my mind. But I did I did have a really nice time visiting with, with John Prosser. And we're now friends on Twitter. That's one or thing that's, that's always interesting because I feel like one of the ways that a lot of people who do YouTube, you know, in the, in the tech space, maybe it's the same in other in other YouTube spaces, but t uh, the, Twitter is kind of like the green room of tech YouTube where, you know, you interact with people who make videos and stuff on Twitter. Uh, and And so a lot of people have a part of their persona that, that comes out online, right? Mm -hmm. But then they're they're much more multifaceted in person than you would first imagine, right? And and John's one of those guys who has definitely has like a persona online, but but having done a lot of live streams and talked, you know, on the phone and those kinds of things in the past, I I kind of knew that John Prosser. I don't want to give anything away here. I don't want to blow his cover. But John Prosser is generally a very nice guy. <laughs> so <laughs> Yeah, so like when you meet him, so John Prosser, to me, is like the Wizard of Oz when Dorothy is trying to find him. And then there's the all-powerful Oz that is not so nice. Right. I'm not saying he's not nice, but I mean, just there's that processor. Prosser, not the processor, as was referred to in a Forbes article before. <laughs> and then behind the screen, he's like much nicer. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so and and there are a lot of people there are a lot of people who don't don't sort of come off in any way like their their online persona. I you know, I've I've sparred with Quinn from Snazzy Labs back and forth every once in a while on the online and he was at CES this year, first time I'd met him in person and he, and he was like he was very gregarious, friendly. We had a long conversation, you know, and I was kind of like Oh, here's another here's another person from online that's gonna hate me. They already hate me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have, I'm sure I have a few of those. I mean, I, I think there's not a long list, but I mean, it's funny the way things work out on the internet and also real life. Because you know, you and I are like we're good friends now, and we do a podcast together. But like five years ago, I didn't like you, of course, <laughs> because of course. you said mean things on the internet, and I was like, this guy's a dick. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and then we got to be friends, and like. I mean, online, I guess you could still be a dick, but I mean, you're, you're a really nice person. <laughs> I appreciate that. Well, it was, it was funny. And we did talk about this a little while we were there. Um, I, I didn't realize, like I, I went into several rooms where there were four or five people that I'd gotten into sparring matches with on for one thing or another. Uh, and, and I was like, wow. There are a lot of people, there are a lot of people that I get in arguments with or, or just like generally don't like me here in this room <laughs> and some of them I met and it was all fine and it was all cool. Some of them, like, I have no idea, you know? A, so yeah, it made me, it made me want to rethink my, my, my whole online persona. But then again, I mean, I don't really think about my online persona to begin with. So I, maybe that's I, just, maybe that's just how it is. Half of my online persona there, is you know, food pictures. For all the people out there that I've made mad because I said or did something on Twitter or on YouTube, uh, I'm really a very nice person. Adam says so. <laughs> in, in, your uh, own, in your own way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I, I mean, so I was glad to get back to CES after after a couple of years. But now we've got coming up here in the next week. I mean, it's just the beginning of the year. I mean, we're barely we're at the end of week two, 2024. And we have two major product launches coming up in the major. coming week. Basically, week. the biggest Android phone release of the year, presumptively, it, and yeah. the coolest, biggest, most expensive Apple product of the year, I guess. I, I don't know. I don't know how you want to classify it, but it's one of those ones where us tech nerds are really excited about it, and the general population is like, those guys are spending money on tech again that we don't care about. 
<laughs> well, I think there are a lot because I've I've been posting on my my community page and on Twitter and other places like that about my thoughts on getting the Vision Pro and all that kind of stuff. Um, and some people are are generally like really curious and want to know what it's all about, but are not going to be able to buy it or not going to buy it, you know, just because of how expensive it is. It's going to be limited quantities, and it's it's incredibly expensive. Um, Very. And the Sam, you know, Samsung S twenty four. I think it'll be interesting to to see what that turns out to be. I I know that it seems like this year more so than other years, instead of like samsung rumor it's it's just like this is what it's gonna be there are no rumors anymore all <laughs> yeah. all of that stuff is leaked and confirmed like <laughs> months in advance I know. yeah i miss the days of secrecy uh, yeah. it used to be so nice back in the days of like the blackberry android phones and the blackberry 10 phones and a code name would pop up yeah. As it was going through the FCC and you're like, oh, I wonder what it is. And then you're like, maybe it's a keyboard phone. Maybe it's a full screen phone. Maybe they change this. And then you're just waiting and waiting. And then after it gets confirmed or like gets certified, you're like, okay, so we know what the processor is. We know what you know the chipset is, blah, 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 right. blah, blah, blah. But you didn't know what it was. Right. And then you would be surprised on the day that it would come out and you're like, oh my gosh, or like, oh, they did that again. <laughs> but yeah. there was always that excitement and I missed that. Like I got yeah. into it with, uh, what's the guy? I think he has something McFly on, on Twitter. He's the, let me see. McFly. Yeah. What's his name? Uh, anyway, so he does, he's like the super leaker online. Oh yeah. yeah. And, and I got into it with him one day because I was like, I'm tired of all these leaks. I It, it really ruins the fun. So, yeah, yeah I, I like the speculation. I, I like whenever we would not exactly know what it is three months before the stinking thing comes out. And there are many YouTubers who, who between launches of phones, like their entire content strategy is, you know, a new video about a leak every day. So. Well, it's crazy because <laughs> when we'll have the iPhone, let's say the iPhone 15 came out, there will be an iPhone 16 video literally the next day. Yeah. <laughs> Are you if, talking if it, about? If it hasn't already happened like the week yeah, before. Sometimes it'll happen before. It's bad with Samsung. Samsung leaks and rumors will start like a month before the new one comes out. So we're sitting here waiting on the S24 and it's like, oh, the new S25 camera is going to do something different. Like we yeah. don't have the S24 yet. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and I think that the fact that the leaks are not necessarily leaks and nothing's really all that exciting in terms of smartphone stuff is that, we, once again, we've reached that, that level of sort of parity and commodity status where as cool as the S24 Ultra or Plus or whatever it might be in a vacuum, it's not going to be all that different than the S23. Fundamentally, you know? no. I mean, there is going to be this emphasis on AI now with the AI for all approach yeah. that Samsung is doing, the new Snapdragon 8 Generation 3. And I don't know. I, I think another thing is, is there's just so much of that information. Yeah. Before, you would have a couple people who specialized in leaks and even like John Prosser before, and even he still does it to an extent. Uh, we'll talk about products when they're going to come out, when the event's right. going to be, blah, blah, blah. But there's no real consequence anymore. Yeah, you have 500,000. There's like all these people that re regurgitate and make the same predictive videos. And if they're wrong, it's like, oh, we're wrong. We're just using it for clicks. So yeah. there's also that too. Yeah. And I, I think that once there's so many videos and the, and the proliferation of, of the information is so widespread to so many different people, it's like, it, it, you know, it, it loses, it loses its edge because you, you could, you get bombarded with it. So I think the S23, S24, we already kind of know what the S24 is going to be. We already kind of know what the major headline is going to be. It, but pre-orders start on the 17th. And Two days so before you, my birthday. You can pre-pre-order. You, you can, can reserve your pre-order. Yeah, which is an interesting technique. But, yeah, there will be some links <laughs> that you can get to if you want to if you want to get your pre-order reserved a couple of days early. Um, well, to, to put this more pointedly, 
in the link of this video, uh, in the yeah. description of this video, there will be a link <laughs> that you can click on if you would like to reserve your pre-order, which what that does is it takes you to the little splash page for Samsung. You put your first name, you put your last name. You don't even need your middle name. You can put your email address and you don't even have to put your phone number. If you fill out those three blocks and hit enter, then you will get $50 of credit towards extras if you pre-order the phone through Samsung. So let's say the S24 comes out, you pre-order it through them. They give you 50 bucks. They'll go towards a case. They'll go through towards a charger. And everybody likes to complain how there's no charger in the box. You can use that free $50 in credit and get yourself a nice 45 watt charger. So, yep. I mean, there's just things, or you can put it towards whatever. So if you feel inclined, like if you think you might want to buy one, fill out the three blocks of information, hit enter, and get yourself free 50 bucks that you can reserve. And and it's also an affiliate link that, uh, you know, helps out podcasts, you know, like. It feeds know, starving children. It well, does. I mean, I have six kids and they're not exactly yeah. starving, but it does help feed them. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, I have a grandson. He's small, but he eats a lot. So. It feeds him, uh, it feeds him too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> We've got some dogs here at the house. So, you know, but no, I, I mean, so I'm, I'm anxious to see what that's all, what, what the, the total details are going to be all about. But then on the 19th on a Friday, which is kind of not a typical Apple time, uh, the vision pro they're, goes on pre-order. They're ruining or, my birthday. My yeah, wife was so like, I was going to do something special for your birthday, but I have to watch this keynote. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Out. And so again, I've sort of been saying the whole time with the Vision Pro that it's something that I'm really interested in and I've I've always been a big fan of like, you know, new Apple products and where is Apple pushing their their technology for the next phase of their existence. And so I always love to be on the on the edge of that. But man, that's an expensive I, edge. It is an expensive edge. And the thing that gives me pause is that, and, and maybe maybe this is part of what I'm, I'm supposed to be doing, so I shouldn't really be worrying about it, but you know, hearing things from, from folks like Mark Gurman, who's probably one of the, the most reliable Apple, Apple information sources, that, th so it's supposed to have a virtual keyboard, right? So you mm -hmm. can type in the air. Well, I guess the virtual keyboard is not going to be ready, and so you can like type individual keys. That's not good. <laughs> well, I, I've said this before. Not everything is going to be ready, and no. the thing is, on top of that, app developers have to make apps for this. <laughs> uh, yeah. So there will be some, but anytime you have a new product, this is essentially a new ecosystem. Not not in the sense of okay, we've created this entirely new operating system from scratch, but they kind of have. And yeah. anything that's existing, like you're going to have to migrate that over and they're going to have to make it work. So I don't expect a whole lot of stuff to be there on day one. Like there'll be stuff, it'll be functional, but there I think will be a lag behind the experience that you might be expecting for at least the first six months. So, you know, I, can't, I my friend, Tra you know, Travis MCP and I sort of talked about this uh, on in a Twitter exchange the other day. There will be Apple, like all of Apple's programs, Safari and all the, you know, all the other apps that are, that are theirs specifically are all going to be available and usable with Vision Pro by itself. But then also Disney Plus is going to be available, Apple TV Plus, uh, Fantastical, which is a third party app is going to be available. But yeah, it's. It's going to take some time if you if you rely heavily on on an app for like like Notion or something like that. It's going to take some time, but I have a I have a feeling there's also going to be ways to emulate that kind of stuff. You can run Notion in a in a browser window, uh, but when am I going to be able to run Boom Beach? <laughs> That's that what I, I need to know. That I don't know, but I, I think <laughs> that I think the one thing that maybe is is like a point of of confusion or not quite understanding is that yes there are going to be vision pro specific apps and versions of apps that are vision pro specific but vision pro is also going to connect to all of your like your apple ecosystem stuff so it, you know your your apple tv your macbook your all that stuff, your iPhone screen is going to be able to like pop up in your face on the Vision Pro and you're going to be able to interact with that. So 
it's kind of two things. It is its own computing device that will have apps and all that kind of stuff, but it is also something that works in concert with all of your existing Apple ecosystem devices. So Yeah, and that, that'll be cool. Yeah, but how ready for prime time is it going to be? Uh, I don't know. So I, I, I just will keep... probably, I'll probably buy the 2025 model. Yeah, and I may, I kind of, it's, 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 I'm sort of stuck in this place between like, so I make YouTube videos and I make a lot of YouTube videos about Apple products. And this will be an opportunity for me, for me to make a lot of videos about something that not too many people are going to have, but will probably be interested in. Well, so if you're trying to take advantage of the YouTube power curve, I expect there to be a lot of interest uh, and demand for content when this comes out because people will want to know about it. And there will be very few people whose hands that it actually is in to make content. So that will give you a leg up. I mean, for sure. Uh, it just depends on exactly how many people are watching it and how many videos you're going to make with it to and yeah. to capitalize on that. Yeah, because I mean, I don't think... I think there'll be a there'll be a market for like how to videos, but it will be a very small market because they're making so few of them. And mm -hmm. the, so they announced the pricing before, but now they've announced sort of what the pre-order what you need to have ready for your pre-order, which, you know, is the normal stuff, but also that would be a good video. <laughs> yeah. Um if you wear prescription glasses, you need to have your prescription available to put into the pre-order form and i was wondering how they were going to handle pres i mean obviously i wear prescription glasses and uh so i was really curious about like okay how they're going to handle this but apparently uh you you input your prescription and it sounds like when you order the vision pro with your prescription uh in the order form then it will come with your <laughs> Your, your prescription, prescription uh, I, I don't know. It's See, these are the, the things that have always been a little bit problematic with VR and AR devices is that, like, if you wear glasses and, like me, can't see anything without them on, then it really presents a challenge in terms of getting those things on your face with your glasses as well. And I don't have contacts, so... I suppose I could get contacts, but I don't. Uh. Uh, yeah. yeah, you could make a video. I got contacts for the Apple Vision Pro. Yeah. Million views. <laughs> yeah, maybe, <laughs> maybe. I, You're yes. like, man, this video is going to be a banger to like 3,200 views. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So I, I don't know. I'm still kind of like on the fence. At one minute, I think, no, I'm not going to order it. The next minute, I think, well, maybe I should. You have two and a half but, days to figure it out. <laughs> I know. Well, that's the thing. It's, it, you know, it, once you order the prescription lenses and the tax and everything else, it's it's going to be over 4000 bucks. Like yeah. with tax and lenses, maybe forty two, forty three hundred dollars $4,300. That's. Here's what you do. Here's how you save some money, right? So you're in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Drive to Wisconsin where there's no sales tax. Oh, yeah. You could save like seven hundred dollars driving to Wisconsin. <laughs> that's true. That's true. That's true. Maybe they, it's only it's only a five hour drive to the border. So <laughs> take a train. So, I mean, yeah, get a Spirit flight for seventy nine dollars. Yeah, but I think those are the things that that I'm looking forward to in coming into this week. And uh, I don't really know of anything else that's Actually, going on. I think on. I so, gave you wrong information. Uh, I th I don't. It's Montana that's tax free, not, oh. not Wisconsin. Montana's far. So. Yeah, Montana's a little far. Sales. I think there's only three sales tax free states. Yeah. Well, uh, Texas. Is oh low, no, right? there's five. No, sadly not. We pay. Oh no, no personal income tax in Texas. Yeah, we have no personal income tax, but no sales tax is Alaska, Delaware, Montana, New Hampshire, and Oregon. That's why everybody wanted to go Oregon. Mm. Oregon Trail to avoid taxes. <laughs> yeah. That Let's ask Donald. I, I lost my wife. <laughs> I lost my wife and my dog, but I don't pay taxes. You have dysentery. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, that's where we're gonna we're gonna wrap it up here for this week. Thanks so much for hanging out with us, Adam. Once again, thank you for for being with us. If you have any questions, if you have any comments, any things that you want to ask us about, or 
or mean things to say that you feel like venting, you know, you can go ahead and, and do that in the comments in the YouTube video. Yeah, it, we'll take it. We'll take whatever you've got. We, we have thick skins. We've been doing this a while. But otherwise... But we may also leave a snarky reply. Yes, we... We may well do that. Um, <laughs> I've been I've been known to do that. So, uh, this past week I decided to start uh, leaving comments to mean comments by saying something like, "Yeah, well, I did that last night with your mom." <laughs> I think or, I called somebody a moron yesterday. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Hey, man. Who knows? Painfully honest replies. If you want to be a, if you want to be a jerk, then you better be prepared to get a reply. Maybe we'll do a special edition where we just take oh, mean you comments. You like the mean tweet saying. Remember they yeah. used to do the mean tweet saying on was like Jimmy Kimmel or something. We could do mean com mean YouTube comments. <laughs> in in an earlier version of the of the podcast, we used to do that every once in a while because I would get a lot of negative comments that would be held for review. So that was that's what we called it. But they don't I don't seem to get as many of those anymore. Like the held for oh, review I do. is not nearly as packed as it once was. Somebody so, told me to kill myself the other day. Well, which is not I, the first time that's happened. No, no and don't think I haven't thought about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, but uh, yeah, so so we'll talk again soon, people. Thanks once again for being here with us. Uh, my name is Jason, sometimes known as the JTL. That's Adam of the Tech Odyssey. Uh, this has been a painfully honest tech podcast. The podcast so honest it hurts. We'll be back next week when we may or may not have purchased things that we couldn't afford. So until the next time, we're out.